All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting Switch 96 le CS196 lecture. All right, let's get started. As always, if you have any questions in the chat, drop it into lecture questions on the Discord or in the Twitch chat, and I will get to it as soon as I can. So today, we're building off what we learned yesterday, not yesterday, day before yesterday on Tuesday, when we introduced ourselves to the idea of concurrency in Rust. Now we're gonna build off of that to learn more about how we can access data and manipulate it in ways that'll better suit our purposes. So let's get right into it. So let's go over our objectives for today. Our objectives are to go over shared state concurrency, issues with shared state concurrency, mutexes, which stands for mutual exclusion, mutexes in Rust, and what we can use concurrency for beyond the scope of just these uh, sort of toy experiments we're doing. So from our last lecture, what did we cover? Well, we learned about channels and thread communication through, through channels in the last lecture. We focused on this because reading from the same memory leads to issues in concurrent programs. We saw in the bank example, if we're reading the same memory and there's no sort of synchronization, we can have these weird numbers that don't add up to what we expect it to be. So use of channels in any programming language is similar to single ownership. So once a value is transferred down a channel, the thread should not access data anymore. So communication via channels prevent different threads from needing to share memory. And this is good. It makes our lives a little easier because you don't have to worry about sort of having this mismatch of what the data should be. But what would this look like? What if we did want to have shared memory for certain kinds of problems? So shared memory concurrency is like multiple ownership. Multiple threads can access the same memory location at the same time. So why would we want to do this? Think about if we have a single computation that we're trying to work on. It's kind of difficult to keep passing ownership nonstop because we kind of lose track of things and it gets a little messy. What if all the threads could access this memory at the same time but we could keep, without this issue they had previously of having these mismatch of numbers? How could we do that? So let's take the sort of naive example. We have this global variable here. We're going to call it just static uh, global var, and it's an i32. It starts from 0, and we're just going to increment it from 0 to 10. So we're going to increment it by 1 each time in the loop. So important, there's three steps taking place when incrementing a variable. So as you remember from last time, we firstly read the current value of the variable, the thread then increments this value, and then finally the thread writes this value to the variable. Three steps, remember that's very important and it leads to a lot of issues later on. It's not an instantaneous thing. So let's see what it looks like in our regular loop in a single thre singly threaded program, no concurrency here. So on loop one, our value is zero, it reads it in as zero, increments it, and now it's one. On the second loop, so loop number one, since we're zero indexing, we get two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, et cetera. So this is obviously very easy and very basic. This doesn't do a whole lot, but this will help us build out to our idea of using concurrency in sort of problem. So let's say now we have two threads, and we're doing the exact same thing. Notice that we're going from zero to five now. But since we have two threads and they're all incrementing by one, we should still get 10. But this should be twice as fast, right? Because we have two threads doing this computation and they're both running at the same time. They're only going from zero to five. Let's see what happens in this kind of example. So our first thread obviously doesn't know that there's a second thread over here. It doesn't know what it's doing. They're both separate threads. So it reads in the global variable is zero, increments it and writes, writes it as one. So here in this current uh, sort of t uh, section of time, in this current iteration of the loop, we set it to one. Now thread two is also just started. It reads the global variable here. It's read it as one right now. It increments it and we have two. So this is our current state after the first loop. It looks good. This is kind of what we wanted to happen, right? We wanted to sort of increment it after each other, one after each other, and we can eventually have 10 at the end. Okay, second loop. This reads the value of two, because that's what it was here. So it reads the value of two, increments it, and now we have three here. We write it down. But what happens that if while thread two, or thread one, sorry, is reading or writing, this is also reading the value. So it reads the value of two, increments it, and it also writes down three. Yikes, okay. So we were already in an issue because we wait, wasted a loop pretty much because they both read the same value and incremented that. 
see, the reason this happens is because we don't know how the processor is going to allocate time for these different threads. We have no idea. If we ran this code multiple times, it might be different each time. So let's say in this current case, thread two actually gets to read first this time. So thread two reads this value, it's three, it increments it, and we get four. Next, thread one reads, it reads four here, increments it, and now we have five. Yikes, again, we're even more like off where we want it to be. And let's say on the second, on the final iteration here, we're only going to three just for the sake of fitting on the screen, they both read it at the same time they increment it. This isn't what we wanted. This is sort of counterintuitive, right? We should have been on number eight here if this is following the sort of reason that we put in. And the thing is, since the threads act independently of each other, and because it's sort of random how and when they read things, we could have several different versions of how this looks. You know, if we're moving on from this state here, we could have a case like this where it's six and seven, a case like this where it's seven and six. And think about it, we could have that through any of these different steps, any of the different iterations. And this is horrible. This is really messy. We don't know what the code's gonna do. We could run it 10 times and each time it'll be different. This is bad, we do not want this. We hate non-deterministic code for the most part. How do we get around this? Well, we we're gonna get introduced to the idea of mutual exclusion or mutex. So mutex is short for mutual exclusion. Mutex is solve our previous issue by only allowing one thread to access data at any given time. So the act to access data that is in a mutex, the thread must first ask for the mutex's lock. So let's say we have a mutex here. To act, our data is here and our data is sort of like inca captured by this mutex. If we want to access and use that data, we take the mutex and we lock it. So once we lock the data, we can access data, we can interact with it, but nobody else can interact with it because it's locked. Once we are done with the data, we unlock the mutex and somebody else can grab it and they can use it. So the lock is a data structure that keeps track of who currently has exclusive access to the data. The keyword here being exclusive. Only one thread can access uh, the mutex at a given time. The other threads who want to use that data have to wait. They'll block and wait until the mutex is unlocked again. So a sort of easier way of looking at this. First, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Is mutex kind of how we solve the bank problem from last lecture? Yes, that's a great way of thinking about it. Yes, this is going to help us solve that bank problem from last lecture. Okay, so let's sort of break this down. So let's say we have a bunch of speakers. The bunch of speakers want to talk to the audience here. But let's say everybody's talking at the same time. How could we understand what anybody is saying? It's going to be horrible. It's going to be people talking over each other. Everyone's hearing differing things. Oh, it's a mess. Let's add a single mic though. If there's a single mic and only one person can use the mic at any given time, then we know that only one person is talking to the people. So it's very clear to know who's speaking, what they're saying, and we're sort of getting the message across accurately. So I had a little mutex here that I wanted to use for this demonstration. Okay, we're just going to use this pencil here. And just so we don't lose track of what this actually is meant to represent, let's say that these people here are threads. Person one to five here are five threads. The mic here is sort of the mutex. And finally, we have the data here. The audience are data. So let's say person one wants to talk. If person one wants to talk, they go up to the mutex or the microphone, they lock it. They have exclusive access to this microphone. Now only they can talk to it. So they take the microphone and they lock it. Only they can talk to it. The other people behind them, the other people behind this person has to wait. They have to wait until the person's finished speaking. Once he's finished speaking, he unlocks the microphone and somebody else can go grab the mic. So if I was person one, I'd let go of the microphone, leave it there, somebody else can take it and use it. So forth and so forth, so on and so forth. Everybody is accessing the data one at a time and they have to wait in their turn, wait for their turn. And this is perfect, this is great. We have no issues with the system unless, let's say I'm speaker one. I'm gonna go and grab the microphone. But what happens if speaker one just walks off with the microphone? Like what if he just gets up and leaves, forgets to give the microphone back?
Okay, so obviously, this is horrible. We don't want this to happen. This is known as deadlock. If a thread forgets to unlock their mutex and they keep exclusive access to the data, let's say all the other threads behind this thread want to access the data, they have to block and wait. And if this thread, this mutex is never gonna unlock because we forgot to write mutex unlock or if this thread is sort of being a hog and forgetting to return the microphone or the mutex, then we're stuck in this loop forever. We will never finish this program and we end up in deadlock. And this is horrible. This is a super, super bad scenario. So key points here is you must attempt to acquire the lock before using the data. When you finish using the data uh, that the mutex protects, you must unlock the mutex so other threads can acquire the lock. So in terms of code, the way this works is if you have multiple threads running the same line of code, let's say they're doing some big calculation and they want to append to our data. While they're doing the calculation, whoever gets done first can access the data, do stuff to it, unlock the, so lock, take the mutex, lock it, do whatever they want to it, and once they're done, they unlock it so other threads can access it. If another thread gets done while a different thread, so let's say thread one is currently using the mutex, if thread two gets done and tries to access the mutex, it'll block on that line. It'll block because it wants to access the mutex, but since the mutex is currently locked, it can't use it, so it just waits there. Once the mutex is unlocked again, all the threads will try to go for it. Whoever gets there first, and thankfully there'll be no issues where two of them get access at the same time, only one of them can use it at a time. The first one to use it will get to access the data, lock it, and the other threads will have to wait. So this protects our data from having multiple people changing it at the same time. So this is a really, really core concept. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat right now. Someone asked, does concurrency reduce big O runtime? That's a great question. It does not reduce big O runtime because big O is sort of more, how many loops does it have? We're still doing the same number of loops. It's just sort of spread out between multiple different workers. It's a good question, yeah. I don't believe it reduces runtime. All right, so there's no questions. Let's get right into the Kahoot, which is over here. Yep, as Sammy mentioned, Big O is nothing more than theory. It's just purely for how we sort of, we understand normally if a Big O is worse, it should be slower, but it's not you know, how it works all the time. And exactly, as Armand said, it makes things much faster. If you parallelize your tasks, things get much, much faster. The sound is echoing, it's my bad. I think it's because my, my mic is picking up from my speakers. Alright guys, I'll wait another 10 seconds and we'll get started. Alright, let's get started then. Shared memory concurrency is like... Think about it, everybody can access the data, what is that like? I'm gonna skip ahead. All right, great job, unless you got this correct. So shared memory concurrency is like multiple ownership. The reason we say it's like multiple ownership is because multiple threads can do things with the data. So that's like having multiple owners. We're not passing ownership. They're all accessing the data, just one after the other. Good job. 
What is mutex short for? I hope everybody gets this correct. I'll be really sad if nobody, if somebody gets this wrong. What is mutex short for? As always, when these questions have any, raise any doubts, you can drop it in the chat and I can get to it. So the answer there is mutex is short for mutual exclusion. I think some people got it wrong, which is a little disappointing to see. Mutex is short for mutual exclusion. It means that only one person has exclusive access, or one thread has exclusive access to data that we're working with. So mutual exclusion, remember that, very important. What is deadlock? Everybody has a good understanding of this. I'll definitely talk about it again. All right, let's jump ahead. Okay, awesome. Most of you got it correct. So deadlock is when a locked mutex prevents the program from progressing. So as we saw with the mic example, when I was using the mutex, if I forget to unlock it and I walk away, all the other speakers are waiting for their turn. They're trying to speak, but because nobody has the mic and they don't know where the mic is and they're still waiting on the mic, they can't do anything, right? They just have to stand there and wait because nothing else is gonna happen. So if a locked mutex is never unlocked and other threads need it to progress, then we'll have deadlock and the program just halts forever. Good job. I believe this is the last one. Actually, no, we have to go back to the lecture now. Oh, am I in the way? Sorry about that. Next time I, I have another scene for that. It's like set up like this. Okay, my bad. Okay. Let's get into some actual code now, because obviously the theory sort of makes sense. How can we do this in real code? So just remember that the mutex is an object, locks an object. So let's go over this code. And obviously you can run the code yourself there, which we will do in a bit. So we're gonna include our mutex so what we're going to do is we create a mutex type using the new function. And within this new function, we have the argument, which will be the data inside the mutex. So we're saying that this mutex has some value and that value is five. Then to access the data inside the mutex, we use the lock method to acquire the lock. So remember, once you lock, once let's say other threads are using it, if you try to lock, you're just going to wait on the line. You're going to block until you can get access, until it's your turn. But let's say you get the lock. Uh, you can then do things with this mutex. And remember, this will block other threads also trying to access um, access the mutex or the data. So we can treat the return value, named num in this case, as a mutable reference to the data inside. So obviously, if this mutex data is immutable, there's no point having the mutex at all. If everyone's just reading immutable data, it doesn't matter if we don't need a mutex. But since it's mutable and we can change it, we can get the value and change, what, uh, change the value of it. So what we can do, oops, sorry, is we can take a reference to num and we can change whatever the value is, or sorry, take a dereference it and set the value anything we want. So in this case, we've set num to equal six. So let's run this code and see what happens. So obviously the data inside our mutex is now six. We acquired the lock, changed the value inside it, and we were now printed out data and we get six. And now you might be a little confused because we didn't unlock our mutex, but don't worry, I'll talk about that in a minute. So mutex is actually a smart pointer. 
the mutex type is a smart pointer. And to be more accurate, the call to lock here returns a smart pointer called mutex guard, which is wrapped in a lock result that we handle with our call to unwrap. So we get mutex guard, we unwrap it, and we get a lock result. The mutex guard can be dereferenced to the point to point to our data, which is what we do here. The asterisk there dereferences our data. So mutex guard also has a drop implementation that releases the lock once mutex guard goes out of scope. So what that means is we talked about drop before. It's how Rust handles memory. So once mutex guard goes out of scope, it automatically unlocks our mutex here, which is great. What that means is that we don't risk forgetting to unlock the mutex because this is done automatically for us. As soon as this mutex is out of scope, we can just end the code. We can just, sorry, drop the mutex, which will unlock our mutex for all the other threads, and they can use it now. Deadlock is nothing for Rust. Rust handles this with ease. Unlike other languages like C, where you have to manually handle everything, Rust takes care of all the heavy lifting. You will never or you shouldn't have any issues with deadlock when you're writing code in Rust. So again, we take our mutex here, we get, we lock the mutex, get the a reference to the value, and we can dereference this value and do what we want with it. We can read it, we can append it, we can do complex computations on it, whatever, as long as we have access to the mutex. So let's say we want to use a mutex with multiple threads. So what we talked about, what we're going to talk about now is more Rust specific because to use mutex between multiple threads, you need more than just the code you saw in the previous example. This is sort of a generalized idea, which would work with a lot of other languages, but how would we do this in Rust specifically with multiple threads? So we have to use something called the arc smart pointer type. Arc is short for atomically reference counted type. And we use arc for additional thread safety with the cost of some performance loss. So we only need to use ARC for multi-threaded programs. We have a singly threaded program, a mutex is enough, it'll be super fast. So let's look at this big chunk of code here. This is going to be a template that you guys can use for your own multi-threaded programming with shared data. So let's break this down. Oops, sorry. So we have a value, so we give a value multiple thread safe owners by using the smart pointer ARC type to create an atomic reference counted value. So what this means is basically a mutex, but it'll work between multiple threads. So now what's happening in this code? We are creating this counter here, which is our archetype, and we're creating a vector called handles. Handles is just for us to keep track of all our spawn threads. So now what we're going to do is we're going to iterate from 0 to 10, and for this iterate, for each iteration, we're going to make a clone of our counter type spawn a new thread and then within the thread we're going to try and get access to our mutex and then increment the value by one. So key difference is why is this different to our previous example where we had those two for loops. The difference here is that because we're using the mutex whenever someone tries to access the data only one person will get to read it and change it at a given point. Therefore they won't be incrementing a value that someone else has read at the same time because they will never read the data at the same time. Only one person can read it at a time. So we block the mutex, increment the value, and obviously once we're out of scope, it'll drop it and unlock the mutex for everybody else. We then push this handle, which is our thread, to this array, and then for all of these array, for all, all of our uh, threads in our vector, we just join. Therefore, we can't end the code until every single thread has run. Once all the threads have run and they've finished, i.e. they've pushed to the vector, we can print our result and we're done. So another key point I want to note is we cannot re... So other threads can't access the data if it's locked. If a thread tries to access this data, tries to lock the mutex while it's already locked, it's just going to block on that line. It'll block and wait indefinitely until that thread is done, unlocks the mutex, and another thread can use it. So let's see what happens here. Any guesses in the chat about what happens? I think it'll be some latency, so I'm just going to run. And we see the result is 10. This is exactly what we expected to happen. So we can just keep running this. We could change the number here, we go to 12 even. This is going to work every single time, and that's because our mutexes 
and ensure that even if different threads go in different orders, only one of them can access the data at a given point, so we'll have the same result every single time. Now as we printed out our result at the end. And our result is 10. And notice here again, if we want to access the data, we do have to lock, we have to try to get access to the mutex. So remember, we will wait block on this line here because we're waiting for all the threads to finish. Once all the threads finish, we'll get access to the mutex again and print out our result. So this is a relatively simple code excerpt and you can't really do a whole lot with it. Just incrementing a single value is sort of a waste of time, but we can use the simple code excerpt as a template to make more complex multi-threaded programs. And this is great when you have large computations. For example, think about a password cracker where you're trying to brute force and break a, break a code. Using something like this is a great way of having multiple threads work on this, pro uh, this problem and eventually try to get an answer. This is much faster than a singly threaded program. So any questions before we jump back into the Kahoot? I'll give you guys a couple seconds to type it in if there are any questions. Okay, no questions, I'll go right back into the Kahoot. Which of the options can cause deadlock? And let me move myself out of here. All right, which the opposite cause deadlock? So everyone got it right for the most part. I think almost everyone got it right. For getting to unlock a mutex and cause deadlock, and locking a mutex that will not be unlocked will also cause deadlock because if it's not going to be unlocked ever, then it kind of jumps back to this thing here. If you forget to unlock a mutex in a program with one thread, it doesn't matter because none of the other threads will try to access the mutex, right? It'll just keep going on. Uh, any questions? Someone did ask a question. Is there a way for read-only ownership? Well, in the case of read-only ownership, it doesn't really matter. Um, like if we're using a mutex, it's because we don't want people to sort of change data each time. If we're only reading the data, we can just pass a reference, and it doesn't matter uh, about having a mutex in that case because everybody can access data at the same time. It doesn't matter who accesses it in what order because it's going to be the same thing each time. So if it's sort of like a constant, we could probably just pass a reference instead. Good question. So true or false, you must attempt to acquire the lock before using the data. The slow cahoot music is always like sort of jarring, especially towards the end. It goes into that weird like Halloween theme thing. Remember that we used a command called dot lock. What does that do when we are accessing the data? I'm gonna jump ahead. All right, true, most of you have this correct. You must attempt to acquire the lock before using the data. Because if you try to access data without getting the lock, it just doesn't work, it defeats the whole purpose of the mutex. You have to attempt to acquire the lock. If you, have, if you acquire the lock, then you only have exclusive access to the data. Once you're done, you unlock it, and everyone else will try to acquire access to the lock. Good job, guys. True or false, when you finish using the data that the mutex protects, 
You must unlock the mutex so other threads can acquire the lock. Remember what happens if somebody doesn't unlock a mutex. I think that's everyone. Okay. All right, this is true. So obviously in Rust, we don't explicitly say that you unlock the mutex. But it's still happening. Even if we don't explicitly write down unlock mutex, it still happens. So when you finish using the data that the mutex protects, you must unlock the mutex. Otherwise, you end up in deadlock, and it's a whole thing, and I'll leave the room. And You have to unlock the data, because if you don't, other threads try to access it, and if you're, you've locked it and you've forgotten about it, then they all get frozen, and they have to wait. They're blocked until that thing is unlocked. And if it's never going to get unlocked, they're blocked indefinitely, and you have deadlock. So good job, guys. Again, Rust helps helps us like beat deadlock because it automatically handles this for us, but it's still happening. Even if we aren't explicitly seeing it, it's still happening. So what keyword do we use to lock the mutex? Somebody got that really quickly. Didn't even like look at the colors. I think that's everybody. Okay. Yep, great job. Lock is the word we use. These other words are just incorrect. We do mutex.lock, and that's the keyword we use to unlock, sorry, to lock the mutex. Get job. I think this is our last, second last question. What keyword do we use to create a new mutex type? I can tell you that the answer is in the question. The answer is in the questions, I hope. That's a good hint. Everybody's answered. Who was going to answer? Oh, never mind. I'll let it run down. I think that's everybody. Never mind. It keeps jumping up every time I say I think it's everybody. Oh, well, time to run down. Okay, great. So the answer is new. If you remember from our code snippets here, uh, we use the new keyword to create a new mutex. Like so. All right, last question. True or false? Arc is not thread safe. So that means multi-thread safe. Can we use arc with multiple threads or not? Arc is not thread safe. That means we can't use it with multiple threads. Okay, thanks everybody. Gonna jump ahead. 
Oh, someone got it last second. Yup, this is false. Arc is is thread safe. So this statement is false because we the reason we use the arc type is because we want to have code that works across multiple threads. So if we want to have a mutex that can work across multiple threads, we use the arc type. So great job guys, unless you gotta correct again. Let's take a quick look at the leaderboard. I'm gonna jump to the animation here. Alright, great job, top three, and to everybody, because this stuff is again complex and it's it is tricky to get your head around it, but it's really, really powerful stuff that makes your code much faster. So let's talk about why we want to use concurrency. So we talked about it for the past two lectures. Why do we care so much? Computers are already so fast, like most of the code you write probably runs in less than a second anyway. Well, it's because concurrency isn't limited to a specific group of tasks. It optimizes certain tasks. And concurrency can increase a program's throughput. So what we define throughput as is the number of tasks completed in a given time. So this increases proportionally to the number of processors. So if you have a lot of processors in your computer, if you use concurrently efficiently, you will greatly increase the number of tasks that can be done at the same time. And this increases the program's throughput. And this can improve the program structure overall, and it usually utilizes hardware better than not concurrent programs. If you're writing linear code and you have a multi a multi-core computer, then you aren't utilizing the computer to the fullest of its capabilities, and your code will generally be, generally be much slower than parallel code or concurrent code. So with that being said, that's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, drop it in the chat, and I hope you all have a wonderful break. It's been a tough semester for everybody, so I hope you all get a very well-deserved rest.